this is the webinar, the introduction to OPC. So um, the idea for this webinar is it's, uh, the audience for this webinar is for people who may come across OPC or interact with OPC on an occasional basis. Uh, perhaps people who uh, configure or manage OPC um, SCADA applications who need to know a little bit more about what OPC does because they see OPC is used for the communications with their SCADA. It's also useful for people who are software or IT engineers who may be hearing of OPC for the first time and interacting with it and need to know a little bit more about how it works. And uh, there's an element of security in this webinar, which we talk about later. So this is good for network security engineers who um, who will need to have a better understanding of the principles of OPC and how it fits into their security topology. Okay, so here's the agenda we'll be going through. It's only a brief webinar, so there's only a few slides. Um, first of all, we'll be talking about what happened before OPC came along, a little bit about the OPC foundation, and then OPC principles, uh, OPC DA and OPC UA and the differences between them. And I'll be talking a little bit later about some free OPC training that's literally uh, come on board in the literally in the last day. Um, so if you want to uh, get some free training on, on, on OPC from Kepware, then that's now available. So before OPC, what was what existed before OPC came along? Before OPC, if you wanted to do, do communications between a SCADA system and a, a PLC, you would go to the SCADA vendor and you would uh, buy his software and you would install it and you would use the drivers. So the, the SCADA vendors would have a driver inside their software for PLC type A, perhaps Rockwell, and they would have a, a driver in their SCADA software for PLC type B, let's say Siemens. Uh, and that's great, but if you only had those two types of PLC on your plant, but if you had a third type of PLC, and let's say it was Mitsubishi, and you bought the SCADA from a company that hadn't written the Mitsubishi driver, um, you were you a bit of a, had a bit of a problem because uh, there was no driver within that. So you either had to decide not to get data from that PLC or not to use that SCADA or 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 um, or something else. So uh, what what uh, was happening is that the there was a bit of a problem. You know, people couldn't do what they needed to do. They couldn't choose the PLC independent of the SCADA. They needed everything to work together in the SCADA to have all the drivers they needed. So. And the second thing was the, the, the SCADA people were spending a lot of their time writing uh, drivers as new PLCs were launched, as new brands come out, as new ranges come out, as new series come out, as new firmware comes out. Uh, the SCADA guys were spending a lot of time writing drivers rather than improving the functionality, the core functionality of their SCADA software or whatever other software it might be, ERP software or, or whatever. So that was a bit of a problem. You then add to the fact that uh, more and more devices in, in the 90s and, and even more so in the last 20 years are gaining communications capability and things became rapidly more complicated and, and uh, difficult. Uh, the number of devices on the shop floor with communications grew, the quantity of software used communicating to those grew and everything was basically mushroomed very quickly as soon as uh, communications became more widespread in the um, in the industrial arena. Okay, so you have a situation where you, you'd have one PLC talking to one client's application. Well, that's fine, that's no problem. But as soon as you get more, you then get more applications, you then get more PLCs, you then end up with a complete mess of, of connections and there's a bit of a wild west of anything talking to anything. So the, the problem came uh, where you, it's very difficult to manage that sort of level of complexity. So the OPC Foundation was formed, and this was formed in about 1995, and it's an independent organization. There's no ownership of it. It's a, a completely independent organization. And the idea is to ensure interoperability between, um, between an, open, an open specification so that pretty much any uh, application from any vendor could talk to any device from any vendor. So it standardized the communications layer Across, across multiple vendors and allowed it people allow people to have a, a better choice of what they used. So, if you look at the, uh, uh, the if you look at um, the, the principles of OPC, what the OPC is built on, you have a, a, a different way of doing things. Instead of having the software all in in one application, as per the previous slide, 
you then had a two separate so bits of software, one acting as a client and one acting as a server. So the client was in charge of the server, the, the, the client would interact with the server, and the server would be at the disposal of the client. It's very much, if you think of a, if you want a real world uh, analogy here, we're talking about um, a customer in a restaurant and a waiter in a restaurant. So you've got a customer that comes in, re requests things from the waiter, the waiter goes and talks to the kitchen, goes and speaks the, the language of the chef, orders the food in that language, and brings it back to the customer and then serves it to the customer. It's that same sort of uh, analogy here. So the client is in control of the server, and the server basically uh, is there at the behest of the client, and the client manages behavior and tells, tells it what to do, tells it what to go and get, when to go and get it. So that's the arrangement that, that exists between the client and server in the OPC model. So you have software, which is an OPC client, and then software such as the Kepware software, which is the OPC server. So without OPC, this is what the, the picture looked like. You had a, a SCADA vendor talking directly to the PLC and each vendor had to write their drivers for each individual device. With OPC, you had it split. So you had an OPC server at the center that was managing all the communications up to all the vendors at the top and all the different SCADA applications, all the different OPC clients at the top, and then was uh, managing the communications to all the devices below. So at a single at a single way, you've made, managed to standardize multiple protocols on the on the device side. You've managed to uh, convert those into one single protocol on the north side. So those OPC client applications only really need to know one uh, client specification, which is the OPC specification. And once that uh, OPC client software has that has the ability to talk OPC. It can then, through an OPC server, talk to a whole myriad of devices. And the Kepware software has over 150 different drivers, so it'll talk to a whole wide range of, uh, of, of devices. So the OPC server would sit there and communicate to a, a, a very wide range of devices, such as Rockwell, Siemens, mid -Sea, Modbus, and not, those are just PLCs, but plenty of other devices as well. And it would also manage all the communications to all the devices, and all the communications to all the device uh, or the uh, client applications so you didn't have a device being being hit by multiple communications from multiple devices from multiple applications you had the ability for the uh, the, the OPC server to to juggle the requests from the OPC clients and feed only one uh, communications link down to the device to keep the device from getting uh, disturbed by more than one communications uh, um, conversation. So the device could get on with doing what the device is doing, which is um, which is uh, controlling the machine uh, or the instrumentation doing what it's doing, and uh, only have one communications, very efficient communication to the OPC server, and the OPC server would, would juggle all those requests on the north side and the south side. The way that OPC servers are configured is in terms of tags. So on the left-hand side of the diagram, you'll see here uh, the communications between the OPC server and the devices. Uh, that, is, that is done uh, using the device's own protocol. So that's, that will be asking using the, the device protocol. So our um, the OPC server would may, may be asking the top PLC for data using the Siemens protocol maybe asking the bottom device for data using the Rockwell protocol or the Omron or the Mitsubishi or the Schneider protocol. On the right-hand side, you have OPC communications, which is using the OPC standard. And that is using the name that's been configured in the OPC server. So in the OPC server, you would declare a menu of tags that are available from the left-hand side, and you would give them a normal text name. And then the client would simply ask for that text name and the OPC server would know where to find that, which channel, which comms link to talk down, which IP address to address, and which data register or, or lo location to go and get that data from, and would return the value. So the OPC client on the right-hand side doesn't need to know anything at all about the detail of where it's coming from. It simply asks for that in the simple OPC structure of channel, device, and tag name. So very straightforward. So you end up with tags, as I've shown there on the, on the screen there. An example of an OPC tag would be tank 17 underscore level. Very simple thing to understand where actually it may be coming from a, a, a register 
in the uh, on the left hand side which would be a, a quite an obscure data register 125 or something very hard to remember those so uh, this is the way that OPC has worked in terms of tags it's very organized so the OPC standard uh, there are first OPC standard came out was based upon OPC DA and it was based upon Windows so um, it used Windows authentication. It used uh, the Windows security model to communicate between the OPC server on one machine and the OPC client on the other machine. So both of those machines needed to be Windows computers in the first place. And the security was using the security uh, provided by the Windows domain and workgroup. Now, if you think back to the um, early 1990s when OPC DA would have been uh, dreamt up by the OPC Foundation when it was just formed, those were the days of Windows NT. And a lot has changed in terms of Windows operating systems and, and, and a huge amount has changed in terms of security since. So um, nobody really should now should be using or installing OPC DA um, installations uh, because they're based upon the security model in Windows, which is 30 years old, and um, which is which is a problem because you do have security issues on there, and the uh, those old operating systems obviously are ripe for exploits if a malware gets onto uh, a network where those PCs PCs are existing. The other downside of OPC DA because it's based upon um, the Windows domain and workgroup security is that both the server and client applications need to live within the same Windows domain or within the same Windows workgroup. And obviously, if you want to pass data from the shop floor up to IT systems, those two PCs won't be living on the same domain or workgroup. So um, OPC DA is probably not fit for purpose for most applications nowadays. And, and you should really upgrade it um, to OPC UA. Uh, one of the uh, later uh, webinars in this series actually talks about how you can uh, comparing OPC DA and UA and how you can actually migrate from one to the other. You don't necessarily have to throw away your existing OPC um, DA installations. You can actually just um, migrate them or evolve them onto the, the UA uh, way of doing things. So let's move on to OPC UA and, and compare that. It's completely different. OPC UA is not a Windows only based uh, uh, way of doing things, not only a, a Windows way, you can run it on Windows or Linux or Mac or any OS really that's able to make a socket and have the necessary, necessary wherewithal to do security. Um, it's based upon the uh, an IP socket, so it's, and it's based upon a lot of security, or there's a second slide about the security. Um, it's very, very secure. Uh, because it's a completely routable IP protocol, you can route it across LANs, WANs, or across the internet. It's perfect for linking through firewalls between IT and, and the shop floor. IT, OT, bridging is ideal for that. And it's it's completely interoperable between dissimilar devices, dissimilar um, operating systems. So you can use OPC UA for a very wide range of applications very securely across a very wide range of networking topologies. So what you have is you have an OPC UA client running on one machine, you have an OPC UA server running on another machine. Um, and as long as those two devices can ping each other through a routed path, uh, then the client and the server can, uh, uh, can exchange data. So it's, uh, that's the only rule you need to know. Can you see the IP address of the server from the client and vice versa? If you can do that, then you're in business. About security. Um, people will be familiar with security because everyone uses it every day. Uh, the apps on your phone, the, the web browser on your computer, all of them are using um, security for, for interchange of data. If you think about when you're doing online banking, um, you have the, the public key of your bank. And when you connect in, your browser sends the public key to the bank. And that basically authenticates that you are connecting to your bank rather than someone pretending to be your bank. The way that um, OPC UA works is that you actually have public and private key uh, uh, encryption working in both directions. So you have the, the OPC client has a key for the server 
and the, the server has a key for the client. So both clients and servers have uh, public, uh, public keys which they share with the other end. Now, that actually makes it secure in both directions. So the server knows it's dealing with the real client and the client knows it's dealing with the real server. So you have a security model which is twice as secure as doing your online banking and no one thinks twice about using online banking um, in a security model, there's no problem with that. So this is, this is, you can see how different this is from the, the very lax old security from OPC DA. OPC UA is, is completely, uh, completely different thing entirely. A bit about the actual um, security itself. It uses SSL, it uses RSA encryption, uh, 128 and 256 bit encryption. As I said before, the, the encryption is in both directions using public private keys. And you can use the uh, security certificates either from a security authenticated company like VeriSign or people of that nature, or the Kept Server product supports its own certificate. So you can actually create the security certificates inside the Kept Server product to share with, with all the clients. So it, it's up to you how, you how you do that. There's also within this Kept Server product a unique feature which um, which is not supported by any other OPC server as far as I know, which is the ability to um, discriminate between different OPC clients connecting in. So you have a, a local OPC client that might be a SCADA that would need full unfettered access so that the local operators on the shop floor could, could uh, look and uh, could read and write every single bit and byte inside the project. But you might have a different application that might be a, lo a logging application in a different department, perhaps um, pulling data and pushing it into the IT systems or the business systems, that application wouldn't need access to all the tags. It may not even need to, to write anything at all. It could just be reading and just reading from a small number of tags. So the Kept Server product has this thing called security policies, and you can ap apply different security policies for different clients as they connect in. That's on top of the OPC UA uh, security. And uh, later in this webinar series, there's a webinar specifically about the security policies, if that's of interest to you. So and we'll give you the link of uh, uh, where you can go to sign up for the other webinars towards the end of, the, uh, of this one. Okay, so that, we're getting towards the end of the, uh, of the agenda now. There's one more thing I need to talk about, which is the free online training. Uh, Kepware were purchased by a company called PTC uh, a couple of years ago. And PTC um, ha are a company that has a lot of uh, training online. So um, the, the training material has been slowly morphed across into the PTC University, as it's known. And what, they are, what they're doing is they're making the free, they're making the official OPC training courses available. Um, the, the training courses up until the end of April will be free. So you can sign in uh, and you can take these courses, which are the official Kepware training courses that you normally pay hundreds and hundreds of pounds to attend. And you can see by the length of each of the modules, these are not itty bitty courses, these are the proper thing. Um, you can run those in your own time at your own pace. Um, and uh, the, the timing shown there are for the average person running at, a, at an average, average speed. As I say, this is a time limited offer. So you have uh, until the April, end of April uh, to take these courses for free. Thank you very much for, um, for watching today. Uh, my name is Dave Hammond. I'm the product manager for uh, the Kepware products uh, at Mac Solutions. Um, we've been the UK technical reseller for Kepware since 2001. So we've been doing this for quite a long time. Um, the URL below, uh, you can see there, is the URL for this whole series. If you want to find that a bit easier, just go to our homepage, maxsolutions.net. You'll find there's a banner there uh, which links to the, the series, and you can go and sign in for more of the webinars in this series just by following the links on that page. So thank you very much for your time, um, and uh, I hope you all have uh, stayed safe and healthy. Thank you.